A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindu newspaper analysis. This video is brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy. Today's date is 14th of March 2023. Displayed here are the list of news articles that we are going to discuss today. As you can see, we have eight different news articles for discussion today. So without much delay, let us get into the first news article discussion. This article says that currency in circulation in India as of March 2022 is 31.33 lakh crore. In March of 2014, the currency in circulation was 13 lakh crore. This data was presented by our finance minister in Lok Sabha. So in this context, in our discussion today, we will revise about the concept of money multiplier. See, money multiplier refers to the mechanism through which the central bank's monetary policy actions impact the money supply in the economy. In India's context, it is the RBI's monetary policy. The money multiplier is a numerical value that indicates how much the money supply will get impacted in response to a change in cash reserve requirement that is mandated by the RBI. The cash reserve requirement in India is maintained as CRR. The formula for the money multiplier is 1 by R, where R is the cash reserve requirement. Yeah, notice that the reserve requirement is in the denomination. So, higher reserve requirement, lowest the money multiplication. Okay. Another important thing that you have to keep in mind is that 1 by R is the maximum possible money multiplier. Now, let us see how money multiplication works. The basic idea behind the money multiplier is that banks can lend out a portion of the money they receive as deposits while keeping some portions as cash reserve. This creates a chain reaction of lending and deposit creation that can potentially increase the money supply by several times. For example, let us assume CRR in India is 10%. This means that bank must keep 10% of their total deposits as cash reserves and can lend out the remaining 90%. As we just saw, the maximum possible money multiplier is 1 by R. So the money multiplier in this example is 1 divided by 10% which is nothing but 10. Now coming back to the example, let us assume the RBI prints a 1000 rupees note. RBI gives this money to a person named Raja. Person Raja deposits the entire 1000 rupees in bank A. Under the reserve requirement of 10%, the bank must keep rupees 100 as a reserve and can lend out the remaining 900 rupees. A borrower named Maja borrows the entire 900 rupees from the bank A and buys a car worth 900 rupees and from a person named Kaja. Kaja then deposits the 900 rupees that he received from Maja in bank B. Now bank B has a deposit of rupees 900. Under the same reserve requirement, bank B must keep rupees 90 as reserves and can lend out the remaining 810 rupees. Now another person named Taja borrows the entire 810 rupees and again the cycle continues. This process can continue with a successive bank keeping 10% of the deposit as reserves and lending out the remainder. Now let us do some calculations. RBI printed only 1000 rupees. Here Raja has 1000 rupees in his deposit account. Maja has a loan amounting to 900 rupees in bank A. Kaja has rupees 900 deposited in bank B. And Taja has a loan amounting to 810 rupees in bank A. Through the banking system, the 1000 rupees multiplied to 3610 rupees. This is an example of how the money multiplier can potentially increase the money supply by several times in the economy. Also know that by reducing the reserve requirements, that is CRR, the RBI can increase the money supply in the economy. If you notice, I mentioned that 1 by R is the maximum possible money multiplier, right? The actual money multiplier that happens in the economy is expressed differently. It can be mentioned as the ratio of M3 and M0. Here M0 is the reserve money. M0 includes currency issued by RBI, bank as deposit with RBI and other deposits with RBI. M3 is called the broad money. M3 includes currency with the public, demand deposit with the banks and timed deposits with the banks. In case of India, the actual money multiplier will be lower than the maximum possible money multiplier. In India, CRR is mostly maintained at 4%. So the maximum 
possible money multiplier in India is 1 by 4 percentage that is 25. But as of 2021, actual money multiplication in India was only 5.2. This is because the usage of the banking system and the penetration of banks in India is not up to the mark. In case of developed economies like the USA, the difference between maximum possible and actual money multiplier will not be as wide as it is present in India. So these are all some of the important points that you have to remember about money multiplier. A very potential preliminary question area. So make note of all the points that we have discussed. So with these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now have a look at this editorial article displayed here. The article primarily deals with the growth projections of China. Now that China in the midst of COVID-19 pandemic implemented a policy called Zero COVID policy. The ultimate goal of the policy was to keep COVID-19 cases as close to zero as possible. To achieve this, China has implemented mass testing, quarantined the sick in government facilities and imposed strict lockdowns that even covered entire cities. Due to this tight zero COVID policy, economic activities in China were also disturbed. This in turn affected the growth rate of the country and this is the premise based on which the article given here is written. The article says that even after the zero COVID policy of China coming to an end, the growth projection of the country has remained low. The article also compares the economic growth profiles of China and India. So this is the overall crux of the article given here. In this context, let us see some of the important points mentioned in the news article. Before that, the syllabus relevant to this news article is highlighted here for your reference. You can go through it. Now, before getting into the content of the article, know that Chinese premier who is the second most influential person of China was recently changed. Li Qichang, who acted as the Chinese premier for 10 years from 2013 to 2023 was removed and Li Kuang, a close aide to Xi Jinping, who is the Chinese president, was appointed to the position. The new premier Li Kuang has said that achieving the projected 5% GDP growth rate for the year 2023 will not be an easy task. Here the author of the editorial article opines that, see, this projection of 5% growth rate itself is very low for the Chinese economy. And the author says that this low growth rate is due to the structural declaration which the Chinese economy is undergoing. So now let us understand the structural problems associated with Chinese economy. See, Chinese economy is very big unlike Indian economy, while Indian economy primarily depends on domestic consumption to boost demand in the country, the Chinese economy depends on external demand to push the production inside its territory. This is due to the fact that China is an export-oriented economy. You may say India also exports, but the scale of demand created by the export sector in China is very huge when compared to India. So now coming to the problems faced by China, see that China's export-oriented economy is now challenged by the China plus one investment strategy adopted by the Western countries. So what is this China plus one strategy? China plus one is a business strategy adopted by foreign businesses to avoid investing only in China and to diversify their supply chains into other countries. This is to be done by channeling investments into manufacturing in other promising developing economies like India, Thailand or Vietnam. Due to this China plus one policy adopted by some western countries, FDI inflow into China are reducing. So this is the first major problem faced by China in its economic sphere. Now coming to the second problem, see the Chinese government for the past few years has been very hard on the private sectors. It has tightened various regulations with respect to private industries operating in China. This in turn has led to private industries not investing money back into the economy. When the investment rate is coming down, the growth rate will also come down. This is exactly what is happening now in China. This is the second structural problem associated with the Chinese economy according to the author. Thirdly, China is planning to produce more jobs. See, while producing more jobs is necessary for ensuring equity in an economy, the downside for China in this regard is that it will affect its economic competitiveness when compared with countries like India. This is due to the fact that wage prices of Chinese workers have considerably increased over the years when compared with Indian workers. 
so foreign companies operating in china will not be willing to pay more for the same work which can be done by an employee in india for a lesser cost this will ultimately result in foreign companies who have invested in china to move towards a more economically viable country to be more competitive so these are all the structural problems associated with the chinese economy according to the author as i already said in the beginning chinese growth rate is slowing down rapidly it recorded only 3 percentage growth last year while it is projected to grow only 5 percentage this year the structural problem which we saw earlier is the reason for this slowdown in growth rate the author ends the editorial by saying that indian economy in the present condition is more reliant than the chinese economy the author says this because the growth projections of indian economy is higher than china for the current year this is the reason why even the imf's managing director termed india as a bright spot in the global economy so that's all regarding this discussion through this discussion we came to know about the structural problems associated with the chinese economy Meanwhile, we also discussed about Indian economy. So, these learned points. Now, let us move on to the next news article discussion. Take a look at this news article. It says that Avin milk supply was affected in some areas of Chennai. This is because of the contract workers did not show up for work owing to some wage issues. Avin is a state government cooperative under the ownership of Tamil Nadu Cooperative Milk Producers Federation Limited. So in this context let us learn few facts about cooperative societies in India. So what is a cooperative society? See a business organization can take many forms. One such form is cooperative society. They have unique features of joint ownership and democratic leadership. Let me tell you with an example. Say Sita is a farmer and she produces potatoes. Many farmers in the village produce potato. they sell it individually to a trader there is only one trader in the village here naturally they don't have any other choice they cannot bargain effectively also so this gives the trader an upper hand and he will fix the prices sita and everyone must sell their potatoes at that price only so sita decides to make an arrangement she calls all the farmers and pools all the potatoes at one place She now goes to the trader and says I have 1000 tons of potatoes with me. If you are not ready to buy at the price that is convincing for me, I will call the trader from nearby village and sell it to him. She can do that because now she has got a bulky quantity and she can find a better market for the potatoes. So now the trader has to come on some terms which is convenient for both parties. Now Sita sells the potatoes and shares the revenue with the fellow farmers. Happy ending. This arrangement is called in modern terms as cooperative society. So we can say that cooperative societies are voluntary organizations of people. Here the voluntary organization is the group of potato farmers. They work together to achieve common goals, which is to get a better price for their potatoes. A very familiar example for this is Amul. I hope you understood what is a cooperative society. Here you should also know that it is your fundamental right to form a cooperative society. Yes, Article 19 of the Indian Constitution establishes the ability to form cooperative societies as a basic right. DPSP also talks about cooperative societies. Mention the article in the comment section. Now talking about their jurisdiction, cooperative come under state subject in the Constitution, meaning they come under the state governments. jurisdiction so the state legislature enact measures for the incorporation regulation and binding up of cooperative organizations and it is based on the principles of voluntary formation democratic member control member economic involvement and independent operation know that there are many societies whose areas of operation are spread across more than one states they are called multi state cooperatives okay now what are the benefits for the farmers in forming a cooperative society see in cooperative societies there are equal voting rights for members so no one person can dominate the conduct of business 
then the structure of cooperative societies encourages member contribute and shared responsibility cooperative societies can eliminate middleman and bring the profit directly to the hands of the producers you remember the story of sita we saw earlier right she can even choose to sell the potatoes to a potato chip manufacturer directly by skipping the trader all together then it gives the members access to credit cooperatives facilitate credit at the nominal interest rate to the members also cooperative societies have helped in reducing the influence of private money lenders in rural areas then they support the government's effort to improve agricultural production they act as a bridge between the government and the farmers for example the government disperses high yield variety hyb seeds and fertilizers through cooperatives while these are some of the advantages of the cooperative societies they also face certain issues firstly there is a lot of government intervention from the beginning cooperative institutions were handled as if they were an integral component of the government's administrative structure as a result government intervention became an important part of how these organizations functions secondly there is a problem of mismanagement a cooperative society's central idea is to elevate farmers to the level of stakeholders but farmers sometimes find it difficult to manage the institutions they lack the managerial and business skills then they have restricted market coverage majority of the societies have only a few members and operate in only one or two location which means they have limited access to market and they don't know how to market their produce cooperatives are unable to develop effective communication and public relation strategies that promote the concept of collaboration among the general population then there are functional weaknesses due to shortage in skilled manpower some cooperative fpos hire fresh bsc graduates as ceos then there are other limiting issues like poor administration over dependence on government dormant membership limited capital non conduct of elections and a lack of professionalism among others so these are all some of the points that you have to remember about cooperative societies in this news article discussion we saw about cooperative societies the advantages of keeping them and the issues they currently face with these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion the article says that the number of cases pending before the national company law tribunal as of january 2023 was 21200 so in this context let us revise about nclt see the national company law tribunal nclt is a quasi judicial body the tribunal handles matters related to corporate law including disputes between companies and their stakeholders or creditors here creditors are nothing but the banks and other lenders the nclt was established under the companies act 2013 and began functioning on june 1st 2016 so what are the objectives of nclt See the main objective of the NCLT is to provide a forum for the speedy and effective resolution of corporate disputes. So now we will see about the functioning of NCLT. See one of the key functions of the NCLT is to oversee the insolvency resolution process under the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code 2016. When a company is unable to pay its debts, it can be declared insolvent and placed under the supervision of the nclt the nclt then appoints an insolvency professional to manage the affairs of the company and initiate the process of resolution or liquidity secondly nclt plays a crucial role in facilitating mergers and acquisitions when two or more companies wish to merge they must seek the approval of the nclt the tribunal examines the proposal and ensures that it is in compliance with the relevant laws and regulations if the merger is approved the nclt oversees the process of integration and ensures that the interest of all stakeholders are protected finally the nclt plays an important role in resolving corporate disputes so these are all some of the functioning of nclt now let us see the main advantages of nclt see one of the key advantage of nclt is that it provides a single forum for the resolution of corporate disputes prior to the establishment of nclt 
Such disputes were heard by a variety of forums including the High Court, the Company Law Board and the Board for Industrial and Financial Reconstruction. This led to a lack of uniformity and consistency in the way disputes were handled and resulted in delays and inefficiencies. Another advantage of the NCLT is that while making a decision, the NCLT takes into account the interest of all the stakeholders. This ensures that the resolution process is streamlined and effective and that all stakeholders are treated fairly and equitably. Appeals against the orders of NCLT is heard by National Company Law Appellate Tribunal. However, the NCLT is not without its challenges. One of the biggest challenge facing the tribunal is the backlog of cases as we saw in the news article. Due to the large number of cases that are filed with the NCLT each year, there are often significant delays in the resolution of disputes. This can result in additional cost for companies and can be a source of frustration for stakeholders. In addition, there have been concerns raised about the quality of the judgments handed down by the NCLT. Some stakeholders have criticized the tribunal for not providing detailed and recent judgments which can make it difficult to understand the reasoning behind a decision. Despite these challenges, the NCLT remains an important institution in India. By providing a single forum for the resolution of disputes, the tribunal has helped to streamline the resolution process and ensure that all stakeholders are treated fairly and equitably. So that's all regarding NCLT. With these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now have a look at this editorial article. This article is talking about data governance in India. The author says that in recent years, India has taken many steps towards its digital strategies. India has adopted digitalization to drive economic growth and to improve the lives of its citizens. India has also made significant progress in the use of digital technologies by providing digital access to bank accounts. India is also promoting digital transactions through UPI and other options. Now, the increasing digitalization requires a vibrant data infrastructure to store all the information. As we all know, India is currently holding the G20 presidency. This leadership has provided an opportunity for India to showcase its advancement in the digital arena, particularly with regard to data infrastructure and data governance. But according to the author, there are some issues prevalent with the data infrastructure and data governance in India. Let us see about them elaborately in this editorial article discussion. Before that, the syllabus relevant to this news article is highlighted here for your reference. You can go through it. Now, firstly, let's start with the Data Empowerment and Protection Architecture, DEPA. See, DEPA is a consent-based data sharing framework created by Niti Aayog in 2020. It is a joint public-private effort to improve data governance in India and it strives to create a digital framework that allows users to share their data on their own terms through a third-party entity. Here, the third-party entity are known as consent managers. So, the consent managers will share the data on behalf of the stakeholders. The launch of DEPA has generated both excitement and concern about stakeholders. Now, let us talk about the advantages of DEPA. See, DEPA has the potential to improve data protection and privacy for citizens. This is done by giving greater control to the citizens over the use and sharing of their personal information. Apart from this, DAPA could also help to build trust in digital technologies and data governance. This is done by allowing individuals to easily manage and control their data concerns. While these are some of the advantages of DAPA, there are certain disadvantages. The first disadvantage is associated with security and privacy. See, if the consent management tool of DEPA is not properly implemented or managed, then there is a risk that personal information could be misused or misappropriated. The second disadvantage is the inconsistency of DEPA. The DEPA may be suitable for some sectors, but it cannot handle the issue of data governance across different sectors and jurisdictions. So, this could undermine the effectiveness of DEPA and it could create confusion among citizens. So, in order to realize the potential benefit of DEPA and to minimize the risks, the DEPA should be implemented in a transparent, 
consistent and secure manner and for that the government can collaborate with the private sector civil society and other stakeholders to realize the potential benefit of deepa apart from this the government should develop clear and effective regulations and standards to minimize the risk associated with deepa so this is all about the epa and we all know about the advances in financial inclusion and the successful implementation of upi in india right these advancements are aided by digital technologies but the question here is whether these advancements can be replicated successfully in other areas like health and agriculture see the use of digital technologies can obviously enhance the access to healthcare services particularly in rural and remote areas then in the agriculture sector the use of digital technologies can empower farmers and enhance their incomes however there are some concerns on one hand the concern is related to security and privacy on the other hand the concern is related to infrastructure connectivity and the availability of a skilled human workforce apart from this there is also concerns about the potential misuse of data and information in these sectors for example in the health sector there is a risk of misuse or exploitation of sensitive medical information for commercial purposes whereas in the agriculture sector there is a risk of manipulation of market information for the benefit of certain stakeholders so these are the concerns related to the use of digital technologies then there is also another issue it is regarding the ownership and the governance of data that is generated and collected in health and agriculture see in india there is a lack of proper regulation in data protection therefore the government has to play a key role in addressing and resolving such issues the concerns must be addressed through strong and robust data protection regulations the development of ethical and responsible data governance practices as well as effective and accountable oversight mechanisms now when we talk about data protection we must not forget about data sovereignty what does the word data sovereignty means here the term data sovereignty refers to the principle that a country has the right to control the collection storage and use of data within its boundary to exercise its right of data sovereignty the indian government has proposed to set up an india data management office it is india's remarkable journey towards data sharing and data governance see the idmo is expected to oversee and coordinate the implementation of india's digital strategies and data governance framework so it aims to promote digital technologies that are accessible and affordable for all apart from this idmo will also work to promote the development and implementation of open source solution to ensure that underlying data architectures are a social public good the implementation of open source and open innovation models under idmo can act as alternatives to proprietary data solutions that are governed by big tech companies here opening up some data infrastructure may be useful in promoting citizen participation and increasing access to information but there are some issues associated with data sovereignty they are nothing but trust and security so here the government is coming up with new ideas in the arena of data governance framework but there are no proper regulations and this undermines trust and security so what are all the solutions to all these problems see the sharing of sensitive personal or financial information may be harmful to individual and society as a whole because it may lead to discrimination exclusion and unforeseen negative consequences so india should follow a middle path between restricting data sovereignty and limitless data flow apart from this the indian government should also need to define the purposes of sharing and usage of data by doing so india must respect and protect the right to privacy with a robust data protection law apart from this india should also balance the interest of all stakeholders including governments business and citizens for the goal of sustainable development finally to meet all these requirements the government should need to focus on developing clear transparent and accountable data governance policies and regulations in addition to this the government should make investment in the necessary digital infrastructure as well this is to ensure that data is collected stored and used in a responsible secure and accountable manner so to conclude india has a unique opportunity to develop and implement a data governance regime if india do so india can become a model for other countries 
that's all regarding this news article discussion in this news article discussion we extensively saw about the digital era of india the advantages and disadvantages of it and we ended the discussion by saying the way forward so with these learn the points now let us move on to the next news article discussion this article is about cambodia the article mainly talks about the issues that are prevalent in cambodia on one hand the democratic institution in cambodia is on the decline on the other hand the developmental activities that are happening in cambodia are detached from people's actual needs this is the essence of the article given here although the contents of this article is not very relevant for our examination we can expect a map related question about cambodia this is because cambodia's general election are scheduled to be held in july this year so as part of this discussion we'll see about geographical location of cambodia now look at this map what are all the information that you can gather from this map first cambodia is not a landlocked country the water body that is closer to cambodia is the gulf of thailand not the south china sea also you can note that laos is the only landlocked country in this region Secondly you can notice that Cambodia is bordered by Thailand, Laos and Vietnam. Also except for Cambodia and Thailand all other countries in this region have a border with China. Okay? Thirdly you can notice that no major latitudes like equator or tropic of cancer process through it. Then you can see that the Cambodia capital Phnom Penh is located on the banks of river Mekong. Also you can notice that Though the Mekong River passes through Cambodia, it does not reach the sea in Cambodia. The Mekong River passes through Vietnam and empties into the South China Sea. Then you can notice the highest peak in Cambodia in the map. It is none other than Phnom Aural. You can also notice the Tonle Sap Lake in the map. Tonle Sap is the largest freshwater lake in South East Asia and it is an important source of fish for Cambodia. During the rainy season the lake's water rises and its overflow feeds into the Mekong River. You can also notice the Cardamom mountain. The Cardamom mountains are located in the southwestern Cambodia and are home to a diverse range of wildlife including tiger, elephant and cloud and leopards. UPSC might ask us about the location of the capitals of the cities in this region. The northernmost is the Vientiane of Laos, then there is Bangkok of Thailand, after that there is Phnom Penh and finally the southernmost is the Ho Chi Minh city of Vietnam. Finally, since Angkor Kar Wat has been in news, UPSC might ask about the relative location between Angkor Kar Wat and Phnom Penh. Angkor Kar Wat is located in the northwest of Phnom Penh. I hope I have covered most of the map based UPSC relevant data relating to Cambodia in this discussion. So these learnt points now let us move on to the next news article discussion. See OE Kenzebiro won the Nobel Prize for Literature in the year 1994 for his poetic fiction work. This is what is given in this small article. In this context let us learn about Nobel Prize in prelims perspective. See Nobel Prize or monetary prizes which are awarded annually from a fund created by the Swedish inventor and industrialist Alfred Nobel. In the year 1895 Alfred Nobel signed his last will and testament giving away his personal wealth to a series of prizes in physics, chemistry, medical, literature and peace. These prizes only after a certain period of time came to be known as Nobel Prize. The Nobel prizes are widely regarded as the most prestigious awards given for intellectual achievement in the world. The Nobel Foundation, a private institution, oversees the Nobel prizes. The foundation tries to fulfill the intention of Alfred Nobel to award individuals with monetary prize for intellectual brilliance. As I said already, the Nobel prize are given to achievers in the field of physics, chemistry, physiology or medicine, literature and peace. But it is to be remembered that an additional award called Swaryas Riks Bank Prize in Economic Science. It was established in the year 1968 by the Bank of Sweden in the memory of Alfred Nobel, and it was first awarded in the year 1969. Even though Swarya Riks Bank Prize is not technically a Nobel Prize, it is identified with the Nobel Award. Its winners are announced with the Nobel Prize recipients. 
and the prize in economic sciences is also presented parallelly at the nobel prize award ceremony along with the recipients of five other nobel prizes numerous indians in the past have won the nobel prize the first indian to win the nobel prize was rabindranath tagore he won the nobel prize for literature in the year 1913 So C V Raman has also won the Nobel Prize. He won the Nobel Prize for Physics in the year 1930 for his work on the scattering of light. Kailash Satyarthi, an Indian social reformer who campaigned against child labor in India, has recently won the Nobel Peace Prize. He was the co-recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize along with the Malala in the year 2014. Other than these Indians some more have also won the prize I have provided the list of Indians who have won the Nobel prize here for your reference you can pause the video and go through it so that's all regarding this news article discussion in this news article discussion we saw briefly about Nobel prize so these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion now take a look at this editorial article this article is talking about the recently released index of industrial production iip for january month see the iip grow to 5.2 percentage in january 2023 in december 2022 the iip stood at 4.7 percentage so the iip increased in january 2023 according to government data the growth was mainly because of the good performance of the power mining and manufacturing sectors so this is the crux of the news article given here in this background let us understand few facts about index of industrial production iip See the index of industrial production IIP is computed and published by the National Statistics Office NSO on a monthly basis. Know that NSO is functioning under the Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation. IIP is used to measure the manufacturing activity in various sectors of an economy. IIP measures the amount of industrial production over a period of time with reference to a base year. At present the IIP is calculated using 2011 to 2012 as the base year. Know that the base year was changed from 2004 to 5 to 2011 to 12 in the year 2017. IIP is a composite indicator that measures the growth rate of industry groups. Here the industry groups are classified into two sectors. Firstly the broad sector it means mining, manufacturing and electricity. Secondly the use based sectors it includes basic goods, capital goods and intermediate goods. So we can say that IIP tracks the manufacturing activity of many industries but notably the eight core industries in India comprise about 40% weightage in the index of industrial production those eight core industries include electricity crude oil coal cement steel refinery products natural gas and fertilizers Now talking about the significance of the IIP index of industrial production is one of the prime indicators of the economic development in India the macroeconomic data obtained from IIP is very important for policy makers as it showcases the current state of important sectors apart from this IIP is also used for the calculation of the quarterly and advanced GDP estimates That's all regarding this news article discussion. In this news article discussion, we saw in briefly about IIP. Make note of all the points and revise it once before prelims examination. Okay? So these learned points. Now let us move on to the next part of the news article discussion, which is the preliminary practice question discussion. Now look at this first question. This question is about Nobel Prize. You have to find the incorrect statement here. Statement one: Nobel Prize is awarded annually for achievements in the field of physics, chemistry, physiology, literature, and social science. See, this statement is actually incorrect. Here, instead of social sciences, it is actually awarded for peace, and it is awarded annually for the achievements. Okay? So the first statement is incorrect here. Statement two. only 3 indians have received nobel prize thus far see this statement is also incorrect more than 3 indians have won the nobel prizes we saw that in the discussion itself right so the correct answer for the question is option c 1 and 2 because both the statements are incorrect here now moving on look at this question about mekong river mekong river passes through which of the following countries firstly china myanmar thailand laos Cambodia and Vietnam. Here the answer is option D 1 2 3 4 5 and 6 because it just passes through all the countries mentioned here. Now look at this question related to index of industrial production. 
statement 1 it is released monthly by the office of economic advisor which is functioning under the ministry of commerce and industry this statement is incorrect we saw that in the discussion itself right it is published by nso national statistics office on a monthly basis nso is functioning under the ministry of statistics and program implementation know that the index of eight core industries only published by the office of economic advisor okay now the second statement says currently the iip is calculated using 2021 to 22 as the base year this statement is also incorrect at present the iip is calculated using 2011 to 2012 as the base year so the correct answer for the question is option d neither one nor two because both the statements here are incorrect now moving on to the final question Consider the following statements about National Company Law Tribunal. Statement 1. It is a statutory body established under the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code 2016 to adjudicate on insolvency and bankruptcy cases. See, this statement is actually incorrect. It is a quasi-judicial statutory body but established under Companies Act 2013. Statement 2 says NCLT has jurisdiction over companies, limited liability entities, then individuals and partnership firms. This statement is also incorrect because NCLT has jurisdiction over companies and limited liability entities, but it does not have jurisdiction over individuals and partnership firms. Debt Recovery Tribunal has jurisdiction over individuals and partnership firms. So the correct answer here is option D, neither one nor two. Okay. Now the question displayed here about the money multiplier is the prelims quiz question for you today. Just go through the question. It is a very easy question. Try to answer it in the comment section. The practice minds question for today's discussion is mentioned here. You can go through it. Try to write an answer and post it in the comment section. With this, we came to the end of the news article discussion. If you like the video, hit like, do comment and don't forget to subscribe to Shankar AAS Academy YouTube channel. Now, thank you for listening.